Welcome to the Explore Words, Discover Worlds podcast, presented by Bradford Literature Festival. Presented in partnership with Critical Muslim, this panel discussion explores who defines the liberty we are told we enjoy and how our worldviews impact the ways we assert our liberty. Our panellists include Shannon Shah, an award-winning writer and broadcaster on Muslim and LGBTQ plus issues, Shamim Meyer, a senior lecturer in criminology and social policy at the University of Huddersfield, and Canon Giles Goddard, a priest in the Church of England and member of the General Synod, and Samia Rahman, a writer and editor with a focus on Muslim identity and culture. Together they will delve into questions surrounding individual liberty and social responsibility, freedom of speech, the rights of minorities, state security and much more. Critical Muslim is a quarterly publication of ideas and issues showcasing groundbreaking thinking on Islam and what it means to be a Muslim in a rapidly changing interconnected world. Recorded live at the 2022 Bradford Literature Festival, join us for a stimulating discussion on the meaning of liberty in our modern world. Well, welcome to this session. Um, this is a panel to kind of launch the current issue of Critical Muslim, uh, which is a quarterly publication of the Muslim Institute, which is based in London. It's our 42nd issue on the theme of liberty. Who am I? I am Shannon Shah, and I'm one of the editors of Critical Muslim, and I wrote the introduction to this issue. And I'm really excited today to be with all of you. Um, we've had a presence at the Bradford Literature Festival from the beginning. We've supported it. They've supported us. So it's really nice to be here. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about this issue before I introduce you to the panelists. So it's a critical exploration of the concept of liberty. So there are quite a few essays that tackle it from a different perspective. So we've got one, for example, that questions the idea of liberty or you know, perhaps the lack of it from an Islamic context by the Turkish writer Mustafa Akyol. Um, there's a post-colonial critique of colonial understandings of liberty by Vinay Lal, a professor of history. Um, there are a couple of issues because you know, the writers were tempted to address it based on current issues you know, in Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So we've got a couple of pieces that talk about it, we talk about it from that perspective. Um, and there are some personal stories as well. People who, through their own experiences, either you know, with, with one of our writers escaping uh, Afghanistan and his experiences as a refugee in the West, or a couple of contributors who are converts to Islam growing up in Norway and Germany. So what do they understand about the concept of liberty? Now, those are sort of the long-form pieces that we have. We've, we've also got short fiction and poetry, um, a review of the, the Venice Biennale, and you know, some of our reviews also touch on the issue of liberty. There's one on the concentration camps in China for Uyghurs, and one on white feminism, um, about which we'll say more later. And, you know, we've got a fun list, a top 10 list of liberal contradictions. And finally, we like to close our issues with a kind of commentary uh, on, on the state of the issue. So we call this the last word. So the last word on liberty for this issue went to the concept of liberal tyranny. And I'll say a bit more about that later as well. So as you can see, you know, we've got a variety of types of contributions. I'm really excited to introduce the panel today. I'll do it briefly now because it's a special year for Critical Muslim, I will go on a bit of a spiel before the speakers do, but don't worry, I'll give them the lion's share of the time. But with me today are uh, Shami Mia, who wrote the last word for this issue on liberal tyranny, Samia Rahman, who is uh, also di the director of the Muslim Institute, who wrote a review of the book Against White Feminism by Rafia Zakaria. And we've got Canon Giles Goddard, who wrote a long-form essay for us on his own personal reaction, and I think it's, it's quite apposite today as we celebrate Pride, on the novelist E.M. Forster, the novels of E.M. Forster, given also that E.M. Forster was the first president of the outfit that we know as Liberty, 
you know, the National Council for Civil Liberties, he was the first president. So um, Giles will talk about his issue. But before I let them tell you about their contributions, um, let me just say that this is a really special year for Critical Muslim because we are celebrating our 10th anniversary. As I said, this is the 42nd issue. Um, our first issue was published in 2012, just in the middle of the Arab uprisings, and it was called The Arabs Are Alive. And since then, we've been publishing issues that are both timeless, so we've got issues on topics like race and power and beauty and gastronomy. And then we've got some of the more topical issues. We had one on virus last year, one on populism, one on artificial intelligence, and of course there's liberty, quite, quite a current um, hot topic at the moment in different parts of the world. And then we have kind of region-specific or country-specific issues that we do as well. Um, our first ever country issue was on Pakistan, and so we've got an event immediately after this, actually, um, on the 75th anniversary of the independence of Pakistan, which will tell you about an upcoming project that we have on the topic of Pakistan and Pakistanis in the UK, but it's a chance to revisit that issue as well, um, which celebrates its 10th anniversary this year. So we've had Pakistan, Bangladesh, Turkey, the Maghreb, West Africa, and so on. How do you subscribe to Critical Muslims? Stick around afterwards. Um, Samia will tell you how. The easiest way is to go on the website or to our publisher, Hearst, or become a fellow of the Muslim Institute, and you'll get um, an issue free in your mailbox and also access to all our other events throughout the year, which we can tell you about. Um, we will be having a proper celebration of a decade of Critical Muslim from the 16th to the 18th of September at St. John's Church, Waterloo in London. Why St. John's Church, Waterloo in London? Well, that's the church where Giles is vicar, and Giles is also a fellow of the Muslim Institute, and is a regular contributor. So we're really excited. Um, I can tell you more about that. But that's, that's the spiel. That's me telling you about liberty and critical Muslim. On to our panel. I think what might be most interesting, because they, they've all come to write for Critical Muslim in different ways, and I'll, I'll just ask each one to maybe talk about their pieces. Shamim, first of all, what's your piece? How did you come to be interested in this topic? How did you come to write? Okay, Bismillah. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Um, you okay? Yeah. Oh, good stuff. <laughs> okay, so um, I, in short, I was asked by Shannon to write the piece, so... Uh, that's, that's, that's my quick um, answer to the question, but, but, but a long and convoluted answer to the question is, is that I've always been interested in um, the questions of paradox, the questions of contradictions uh, in, in, within society. Um, so um, I'm an academic based uh, at a small university, just up the road at the University of Huddersfield, and um, most of my writing is actually on a, um, Muslims within the West, um, but also the the public policy framing of Muslims. Um, within the broader uh, kind of context, it's, um, I, I'm really interested in, in, in the Muslim question vis-a-vis -vis, um, Muslims living in, in, in European secular, secular society. Um, and the Muslim question isn't necessarily unique because we had previously, we had the Jewish question, the Irish question, the black question. So it's, it's trying to understand, make sense of uh, Muslim experiences but within a much more kind of longitudinal, longitudinal context, if you like. Um, so I was really fascinated about the whole paradox of, of liberalism. On the one hand, you know, you have a, an articulation of, of, of liberal values, which is seen as kind of open, transparent, something which should be em embraced, something which should, you know, should be tolerated, etc. Um, but there's also, within, within a more broader kind of historical context, you have a, a big paradox because some of the kind of the key liberal thinkers, uh, such as John Locke, Edmund Burke, and various other individuals who were kind of advocating the idea of liberalism, it actually was done at a time when you had colonialism, where you had uh, you know slavery, etc. So you've got this huge paradox that's basically taking place within within um, liberal di uh, discourses. So within the article, I was really interested in in, in uh, picking out um, some of those kind of broader contradictions or perhaps the darker side of liberalism 
that perhaps we don't necessarily read about within, yeah, you know, within um, uh, the, um, the broader uh, broadsheets um, or within, within public policy discourses. So I was really interested in, in, in perhaps teasing out some of those paradoxes and contradictions. Thank you. I just wanted to read, when I, when I was editing this piece, I really liked how Shamim started with a story to illustrate the contradictions that he's talking about. I'll just read it to all of you instead of telling you about it. So Shamim writes, In Britain, we have seen how, during the fall of Kabul to the Taliban in August 2020, 2021, Airbus A330, a flight chartered by the UK charity Nauzad, was able to fly out from Kabul airport with the direct intervention of Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Now, this was not the only chartered plane to leave Afghanistan. Most Western citizens made a quick exit, fearing Victor's justice from the Taliban. Unlike the other flights, Nauzad's Operation Noah's Ark was unique because it was not airlifting humans to safety. Rather, it was prioritizing animals, especially cats and dogs, from remote places in Afghanistan and bringing them to the UK for sanctuary. While the British government was quick to support Operation Noah's Ark, it refused to grant asylum to Afghans who had been employed as British embassy security guards through a private Canadian company called Garda World, which offers private security services, services in scare quotes, to the global neoliberal privatization of war. The embassy security guards were notified via telephone that they would not be eligible for asylum claims because they were employed as contractors. A war that started with liberal expansionist claims of spreading democracy, rule of law, and the empowerment of women ended with an Airbus A330 chartered plane carrying 173 cats and dogs to sanctuary. I will let that passage speak for itself, but I wonder, Shamim, if you wanted to elaborate and talk about how that connected with some of the other examples you were giving. Yeah, so um, when, when you asked me to write this piece, uh, this, this, this was a major controversy that, that was unfolding right uh, in front of our eyes. Um, so it was, a, it was, I mean, initially I wrote the entire piece just on the Nauzad case. Um, so the entire 3,000 word actually revolved around this, this kind of charity. So I, I did a great deal of research, uh, background research about you know, the, 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 key, the key figures, etc. So the entire piece was actually written on Nauzad. And then during the time of editing, I kind of changed it entirely. So, so it, was, it, was, it was the piece that you know, turned, out, turned out to be the case. So for me, it was... All the contradiction, the liberal contradiction, was actually encapsulated by this particular case study. Um, because on the one hand, you have kind of liberal expansionist aims, you know, rule of law, gender equality, etc. Um, and the war of Afghanistan was very much predicated and justified on those aims and objectives. Um, and then you've got the closure happening, you know, the end of the war in Afghanistan, where all the kind of um, the Allied troops you know, leave, leaving the country, um, but you had this major controversy taking place. Um, so so if, if, if you look at the kind of, uh, a, the sanctity of life, the sanctity of life, um, a, a, the sanctity of animal life is taking more of a kind of precedent than human life. So, so, so you've got that kind of contradiction taking place. Um, but the other major contradiction is, if you like, uh, you have an opening that takes place. And this is where the likes of Judith Butler and various other uh, a, um, philosophers and sociologists have managed to actually capture that. Is that within kind of Western liberal discourse, um, human beings um, or, the, or the rights of human beings are actually predicated um, upon the notion of social construction. So in other words, that human, human life doesn't actually exist as an ontological reality. It's socially constructed within discourse. Um, so, so the start of liberalism, you had this major contradiction because black people weren't necessarily seen as human beings. So they, they weren't necessarily uh, including with, within, within, within the category of, of human. In the same way that you've got this kind of Nauzad charity war in Afghanistan, you've got, you've got the you know, airlifting of, of animals um, being prioritized 
uh, instead, of, instead of human beings. That also kind of demonstrates this idea of you know, the, 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 the contradiction at the heart of liberalism, whereby individuals, human beings, actually constructed in different, you know, different ways. So I guess in this article, that I, did, I did try to kind of unpick some of those, some of those ideas in some, some detail by using this uh, you know, as, a, you know, as a case study. And I think, you know, Sami's piece about feminism, I mean, I've not read it because it just, it just, it just, just, pub, um, just published as, as we speak. I think if, if you look at it, I, I mean, some of the kind of the contradictions within, within, within feminism, within, within the European context, within European context, the, the, uh, the paradoxes and the contradictions are actually kind of emerged because you've got, you've got the rights of, you know, I mean, and Wadud and various other kind of uh, feminist writers um, Muslim feminist writers that were basically writing at that particular time, because they 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 knew that the you know the inherent contradiction that the war was actually justified on the back of 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 of, of women's right, if you like. So so you so you've got all these kind of great contradictions actually taking place, and I just want you to kind of highlight those paradoxes, if you like. Um, I mean, I don't know if it, if it answers. That. I think that it, that does answer the question, and I think that was a really nice segue to Samir. But before we get to Samir, it made me think of where, you know, it's, it's a short piece. The last word is usually, you know, our longer pieces are 3,000 to, 3, to 5,000 words. The last word is maybe a couple of thousand. So Shamim starts with this Nauzad animal rescue example and ends with a comment about a far-right fascist philosopher, Julius Evola. Well, I, you know... I mean, he's a hero to uh, the far-right movement, even in the present. And it almost feels to me like, yes, we're talking about liberty. And when we think about liberty, we think about movements for social justice. We think about the abolitionists. We think about the suffragettes. We think about the French Revolution, the Enlightenment, and so on. But you sort of land on this philosopher who's the darling of fascist movements, not just now, but there's, there's kind of an intellectual lineage that he and other philosophers like him have. It's almost like, as we talk about these grand ideals of liberty, there's this intellectual activity that's sort of happening in the weeds as well, and it's always been there, and it's been sort of the silent partner that has shaped the concept of liberty. So, I mean, that's my... Reading. I mean, Shami mentions this quite briefly, and um, but that's that's the thought that it sparked. So I wonder what you know. You would say, "Am I reading you right by bringing him into yeah, the picture?" Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. So I mean, so, I mean, some of the early critiques of liberalism. I mean, you, you, uh, I mean, you, it's, you don't have to necessarily dig deep to actually find it. I mean, if, if you pick up someone like, I mean, Salman Saeed's here. I mean, he's 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 mashallah, he's, he's spent his entire life, that's Bobby Said, by the way, Hannah, that's my daughter. <laughs> uh, no, so, so you don't necessarily need to dig deep to actually find out some of those kind of contradictions. I mean, if you pick up, say, for example, David Theo Goldberg, um, so he has, a, you know, this, this one of his seminal, early seminal books called The Racial State. So he talks about, you know, the rise of the, ra the racial, you know, the, the, um, the rise of nation states um, are actually happening at a time when you've got the kind of advancement of slavery and various other you know, expansion of colonialism, you know, taking place. So, I mean, in, in this piece, I, I kind of talk about how the, the, the other, how the non-European, actually gets baked into the fabric of liberalism earlier on, if you like. Um, so during the start of, you know, the nation states, you, you, you've got this kind of in, inherent kind of contradiction actually taking place. So I guess in that piece, much later on, what I was basically saying is that some of the critiques of liberalism have actually taken place from different quarters. Um, and some of the recent critiques of liberal, liberalism has actually come from traditionalism. And in the piece I talk about, say, for example, the Russian philosopher Alexander Dugin. Um, so, so he has this kind of idea of critique of liberalism uh, within, within the, kind of the, the framework of traditionalism. And uh, Dugin doesn't necessarily trace traditionalism through uh, a um, Renan. I mean, most, most of the Muslim thinkers actually take critique of liberalism through, uh, through um, a Renan, but he takes it from Evola, um, the, Italian, the Italian fascist. So I guess what I'm basically trying to tease out is that we've got a collapse of liberalism. Um, and and the, the classical case that I kind of draw upon to kind of highlight the, um, um, the, the, the failure of, of liberalism as a way of maintaining a kind of, kind of a, a order um, 
uh, if you like. That's, that's failed, and, and I use the, um, the Nauzak charity as a classical example. In the same way that I kind of critique um, Evola and Dugin by saying, look, you know, there's, there's also an inherent contradiction because that particular idea actually looks at the past in order to understand the future. And what I'm basically saying is that future is so complicated, um, it's full of complexities, contradictions, etc. You need a different ideas as a way of navigating the, you know, the contemporary kind of malaise that we actually find ourselves. Um, and the war in Ukraine, what's actually happening in Russia, isn't necessarily, I mean, there's one way of looking at the world, if you like, in geopolitical terms. But another way of reading it is, is that, is that you know, Putin is being informed by a certain philosophical heritage, and that heritage actually comes from the likes of Alexander Dugin, who is basically drawing upon a different framework altogether. And I mean, although you can, you can look at the war, but the, the way I'm reading the war is, is not necessarily in a, a, at, a, at a geopolitical level, but you can actually read it at a much more deeper philosophical level as well, because these are different ideas that are complete, c competing for kind of understanding and making sense and also managing the, um, you know, the complexities that we actually we find ourselves with. Yeah. I mean, those two are not, are not the only one. I mean, there's, you know, you, I mean, I know Bobby's writing a book on kind of Islamism. So there's, there's different ways in which you can, you know, you can draw, you know, draw upon, you know, the philosophical heritage as a way of making sense of, of, of the situation that we actually find ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I will yeah. return with some questions, but I think, as I said, that was a way to bring in Samia as well. But same question to you, Samia, initially. So t tell us a bit more about yourself and how you came to write this review, because we are quite you know, when, when we commission reviews, we sort of think about who would be the best person to write this review or to contribute to this last word. So tell us a bit about yourself and your piece. So a little bit about myself. So um, I'm one of the deputy editors of Critical Muslim. I'm also the uh, director of the Muslim Institute. Um, and um, I, I've been, I've, I've written quite a lot on uh, sort of you know, the issue of, of spaces within uh, feminism and in gender discourse um, that locate Muslim women. Um, and I, I suppose, um, I, so I saw this, so I, I came across this book, I'd, I'd heard of Rafia Zakaria, the author, um, and the book was titled Against White Feminism. And I thought that was a really deeply provocative title. Um, and, you know, and also what I knew about Rafia Zakaria sort of um, slightly um, biased me against sort of warming to the book because um, as I write in the review, she had written um, a very sort of uh, tabloid-esque, sensationalist um, article for a, a, a Pakistani um, newspaper called Dawn, uh, Dawn News, which is an English language um, newspaper uh, published in Pakistan. And she wrote an opinion piece, um, I think it was in 2014 or 15, um, talking about the grooming scandal in Rochdale. And she, you know, she used very, um, very sensationalist language about, you know, these ghettos in these northern cities. And, and she was talking about, you know, where these, you know, Pakistani communities, they, they let their children run riot on their streets. They park without thinking. Um, it, it, was, it was just such a kind of grotesque um, generalization, probably with kernels of truth, but, um, but so, so, but it, I just, you know, I, I remember at the time thinking, what a caricature, what a, you know, what a sort of sleazy piece. Um, and then, and then years later, she published um, this book against against white feminism. And I remember thinking, um, I don't think I'm going to like this. I don't think I, you know, I, you know, I'm sure it's going to be like a, a host of generalizations. Um, and it's a very provocative um, title, um, but. As I started reading the book, um, and it was uncomfortable reading, um, you know, you know, I, you know, I'm Muslim. I'm a, I'm a woman of color. I do define myself as a, as a feminist, um, but I also identified um, aspects in her critique of, of white feminism that made me think about my own um, attitudes and my own sort of. Uh, Kind of navigation of, of spaces within, you know, gender ideology. Within, um, you know, w you know, what it, what does it mean to be a liberated woman? What, you know, what what does what 
form does liberation take? Who gets to define liberated Muslim women? Um, so, so, while reading, so, while writing, so while reading the book and writing the review, I think one thing that um, I really thought about was the way in which um, positions change. Um, so, you know, Rafia Zakaria, you know, had, you know, she wrote this really, uh, you know, I thought, I thought, that, you know, this piece in 2014 that was almost fueling Islamophobia, um, you know, with its kind of cultural stereotypes. Um, and then, you know, she, she, you know, years later, she, she, you know, went on to write this, this thought-provoking, this nuanced, this really visceral, angry, um, but incredibly intelligent book that was, um, you know, like a, like a necessary slap in the face, you know, to, to all of us. Um, and, and so, so, so it made me think about, so I write a little, um, so there, there are two strands in my review. One is looking at sort of um, how, how, you know, work that we produce as writers, you know, whether it's um, an article, or whether it's um, a book that we've written, whether it's, um, uh, you know, something, an opinion piece that we've published online, how the written word is, it's like a, a stop off on a, on a journey of perpetual sort of development of thoughts and how, because at, um, at the Muslim Institute, for example, I'm, we're often asked, you know, what is your position on this? What is your um, position on uh, this issue or that issue? Where do you stand on this? And, you know, what, what we do is we provide a space um, in which, you know, discussion and, and debate occurs and, and we don't take a kind of fixed dogmatic position because essentially, you know, the, the Institute and the Critical Muslim and the work that we do is all about, um, you know, encouraging plurality of thought and diverse diversity in, in uh, sort of exposition, in, in, in sort of developing ideas. Um, so, so, so when I was reading the book and writing the review, um, I, th I thought about how, you know, the words that we publish, the words that we print, are um, they go out into the universe. They're, you know, they they are received by readers, by an audience, and it's there that the the exciting stuff happens. You know, they intersect with other attitudes, with other discourses. You know, and they take on a life of their own, um, and. And that's how, and that's how we continue to evolve. So, you know, so 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 when we so when Rafi Zakaria, you know, wrote her piece, that was reflective of a, a, a place in her in her life, in her thinking, and what she does with against white feminism is is really liberate herself from a lot of the um, kind of you know, white feminist oppression that had probably, you know, cultivated, um, you know, the, 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 her, her perspective on, you know, British Muslims in northern, British Muslim Pakistanis living in northern cities, you know, uh, and, and, and grooming gangs and, um, you know, and, and seeing that as, you know, from the perspective of, of a Pakistani living in Karachi. So, so, so that was that was one strand of, of of my essay, really looking at the kind of the evolution of thought, the, you know, the how all, all that we all that we write it is alive and living and is not and is not fixed and 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 rigid and stagnant, um, and how if you publish a book, um, you know, you may publish a book sort of or, or, or write an article sort of in a couple of years that that, that really kind of um, rejects or moves on from a lot of what of what you you sort of um, articulated initially, um, and, and then but but but, but the, my review of the book itself, um, I mean, gosh, this this was uncomfortable reading. This was, you know, a really um, it 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 was it was looking at the way in which um, white feminism excludes. Um, alternative or other ways or others, different ways of being feminist. Um, so, so Rafi Zakari really 
um, she, she, she critiques not white women or white feminists because you know the, the concept of white feminism is really about there is one way of being liberated you know and, and as Shamim said you know um, the, these are the um, you know the, you know these are the, are, are the ways in which uh, wars in Afghanistan were sort of justified you know because we need to liberate these uh, oppressed Muslim women from, you know, the, the, the veil and the chador, and uh, and it's this idea that Western concepts of, of being a feminist is the is the only way to exist. So, uh, Rafi talks about um, resilience over rebellion, and how each are equally valid, yet rebellion and rejection is prized over um, endurance. And, and, and this made me think about, um, uh, a, a, a few weeks ago, we had um, the Muslim Institute's annual Ibn Rush lecture. Um, and it was delivered by uh, the director of War on Want, uh, Asad Rahman. And he talked very much about um, the concept of resistance and the concept of struggle and how um, activist struggle in the global south is really diminished and undermined and is really um, dismissed because you know the, you know the sort of um, the global north has a very fixed idea of what it means to um, you know to kind of you know to undertake activism to um, uh, to to fight against uh, you know climate crisis and yet you know so many um, indigenous populations. Um, people located in, in, in the non-Western world are undertaking resistance and activism in ways that just don't, don't fit the model. So, so, the, so, so, so I think, I mean, the, you know, um, against white feminism is really about how do we locate different plurality of, of you know, being, the plural ways of being feminist within the spaces that, that exist and how and how do you know? And how do we emancipate uh, thinking um, to to open up this concept of feminism so it's not monopolized just by this narrow interpretation that is that is uh, informed and decided by and constructed by Western-centric white feminist ideology. Thank you for that. Um, I will ask you one thing before I move to Giles. I think I think you raise some really important points that many of the other essays in Liberty address, this kind of, the, the paradoxes, number one, but what sort of paradoxes? So I think what you and Shamim are talking about are sort of the, not just the colonial appropriation of liberatory concepts like liberty or feminism, but the, the very colonial shaping of them and how that relates to race and class and so on. Um, I don't want to go down, down that route because I think what, what came up very interestingly as you were talking about your review, and also when you read the review, um, and also when I spoke to you, because you know, Sami and I have regular editorial meetings, and she was reading the book, and I remember in the early stages, you were like, I'm so uncomfortable reading this book. But it sounds like that kind of emotional journey, you know, we talk about changing people's minds and attitudes, but there's also a deep emotional component. You had a deep emotional reaction to the book, and it sounds like Rafia Zakaria, has also had a deep emotional journey herself in her journey from writing that um, op-ed for Dawn, you know, where it was quite stereotypical and Islamophobic, and to where she is now. So I'm just wondering, is, is that something you, you've reflected on? What, what are the roles of emotions in how we think about concepts like feminism and liberty? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and I think, um, I mean, Rafi Zakaria, she, um, you know, in the in the book, she 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 sort of gives us anecdotes of situations in which she you know contorted her sense of self, um, her, her sense of who she was, um, and minimised her Muslimness or her you know or her colour or her um, ex, you know or, or she, just to contort herself to fit in the narrative. Um, that that she that she was trying to integrate into, which was a Western feminist narrative. So she talks about, you know, going to um, a bar and, you know, 
not drinking, you know, being amongst all these kind of liberated, you know, uh, New York Western feminists, um, and not drinking, and trying to fit into, um, you know, the the the, li the life experiences and the um, and, and the stories that they were telling, and to be a part of that without being too, um, you know, without being too foreign. Um, and I can I can so relate to that. I can absolutely relate to um, you know dampening down my otherness to you know to sort of being painfully aware aware of how you know passing I am. You know I mean it, it's like um, Audrey Lord and you know talks a lot about kind of um, you know being being the uh, the, the African American um, feminist talks a lot about kind of having a mother who passed as, as white and and yet she was you know Audrey you know her you know was the one who betrayed her mother's non-whiteness and you know uh, and I think um, this you know this journey of, of liberation is really about sort of unshackling yourself from those expectations and 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 really kind of finding the, the spaces um, that are true to your lived experiences and not having to um, numb them or or you know limit them or be ashamed or embarrassed of them um, and I and I think that's something that you know Rafi Zakari obviously learnt in the book and she writes about that journey and it's just something that I can you know I can relate to you know I, I used uh, I used to sort of I don't want to get too personal, but I you know, used to be just so very kind of integrationist and so sort of, you know, well, if we just, you know, we just need to fit in. Um, and, and I can see how wrong and how, how much of, you know, how, how much violence that perpetuates on the kind of feminist psyche um, as a woman, making yourself small, as a woman of color, trying to fit in um, and seeing, you know, true liberation in a, in a kind of context that's that's not yours, that or that you know that that you try are trying to belong to, but won't give up space, won't give up room to allow you to enter. Um, so yeah, this this was this is an, an emotional book, um, and so you know certainly you know it's it's uncomfortable because because it's painful because I think with any liberation struggle. Um, you know, when, when there is oppression, um, you know, oppression is unintentional often, and it's about sort of identifying and, um, and calling that out, and also kind of reinterpreting your own understanding of how you live your life and how you create space for yourself and other people, um, that is, you know, that is a way of kind of, you know, finding that liberation. I think, thank you for that. I, I will move on to Giles in a minute. And I think what, was, what is especially beautiful about your review and many of the best reviews in Critical Muslim is that it's, it's wonderfully written, it's gorgeous prose, but we learn not only about the book and we feel like we want to read the book, but we learn something about the reviewer as well, this putting of the reviewer's self, the writer's self into the review. Um, and I think that actually leads really nicely to Giles because I think your piece uh, in a way, it, it is a review of Forster, but it's more than that. It's about you as well. So maybe same question to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you come to write uh, your piece for Critical Muslim? For this issue of Critical Muslim, you've written more pieces, but this one. Well, a bit like Shamim. I mean, I wrote it because you asked me to. <laughs> <laughs> but I asked you for a reason. <laughs> Don't give the obvious one. <laughs> But, and I was actually quite surprised when you did ask me to, because I thought, what's the connection between... Is that, is, the, is, that, is that OK? What's the connection between Forster and Critical Muslim, really? Because it kind of wasn't obvious to me, because if you know his work... I mean, he's famous for four novels, really, for Passage to India, um, Morris, Room of the View, and Howard's End, and they've all been turned into big Merchant Ivory films, and so I suppose if you thought of Forster, you'd probably think of someone as, who's a kind of quite conventional member of the British literary, literary establishment, um, you know, who was someone I was very much taught at school. And so I was a bit kind of taken aback when you said, write us something about Forster. And then you told me that he was president of the National Council of Civil Liberty. 
And then I went back and read his books, reread his books, which I'd read when I was a teenager. Um, and I discovered that he was kind of much more interesting than I thought he was, um, which kind of explained why his books resonated with me so much when I was a teenager. Because actually, I think he was very subversive. Um, and in some ways, he kind of instantiates, in a, in, a, in a way, he instantiates some of the kind of paradoxes which you've both been talking about. I mean, he was brought up, he was an upper-middle-class white English person who went to private school, but he was also gay. And when he was at Oxford, he was tutoring, and he fell in love with a young with an Indian person, young, a bit younger than him, unrequited love, but he, as a result of that, he kind of had a real sense for India. Um, as part of the kind of colonial administration, he went to Egypt, and there he fell in love with an Egyptian bus driver, um, and so he had a very strong relationship with him for a while. Um, didn't work out. He then went to India, partly to see the person that he'd been in love with, but also because he wanted to kind of understand India better. Um, and all the time, he was sort of on the cusp between, you know, being a very conventional person in some ways. You know, he lived with his mother. Um, everything in of sexuality, homosexuality was completely illegal in those days, so you had to live a very secretive life. He knew lots of the people who were kind of involved in the secret service in the 1930s, although he wasn't himself a spy, but he knew people who were. There was a lot of kind of amb ambiguity about his life. And that really comes out in his books. And I suppose that's, you know, that obviously resonates with me. Um, can I just read a little bit from my review? Because that might, um, ex might say it. it's, a, it's a few paragraphs, but, but it kind of relates both to this present, to the why you asked me to do it for Chris Wilmsley and also to me. Forster viewed the empire with distaste. He was opposed to the occupation of India by the British and distressed by the behaviour of the imperial civil servants plucked out of their suburban milieu and plonked down to their great discomfort in the new colonial quarters of New Delhi or Calcutta. Much of A Passage to India is drawn from first-hand observation. Here's a quote. The performance ended and the amateur orchestra played the national anthem. Conversation and billiards stopped. Faces stiffened. It was the anthem of the army of the occupation. It reminded every member of the club that he or she was British and in exile. It produced a little sentiment and a useful accession of willpower. So you can see that Forster was not a fan of empire. But for me, Forster opened a window into another world. As a teenager in an English public school in the 1970s, struggling to understand my, my sexuality, I found myself in a lonely desert. Homosexuality had only been partly decriminalized 10 years before. There was hardly anything for a young gay man except negative stereotypes on television, snide references to the Bloomsbury Group in the Sunday papers, and Morris, which was his novel. The thing about Morris is that he wrote it in the 1910, but he said that it couldn't be published until after he died. Published in 1971, I still had the copy I bought from the school's paperback bookshop when I was 17. Rereading re it for this essay, I find I can quote whole sentences and I recall the sense of freedom I felt when reading it for the first time. Here's another quote. They cared for no one. They were outside humanity, and death, had it come, would only have continued their pursuit of a retreating horizon. A tower, a town, it had been Ely, was behind them. In front of them, the same sky, paling at last as though heralding the sea. The song of the lark was heard. The trail of dust began to settle behind them. They were alone. So I think for Forster, it was very much about freedom. Um, and what he was trying to do was to challenge, really, the, the, the kind of rigorous conventionality of the world in which he was living. Um, so if you look at, you know, A Room with a View, the central character of The Room with a View is Lucy Honeychurch, Lucy Honeychurch, who is a very strong woman. And the whole of the book, of, the whole of A Room of View is about her dealing with the conventions around her, which is stopping her from being the kind of person that she is called to be. And so she falls for George, who is also very unconventional. And in the end, you know, I'm sure you've all seen the film, so it's not a spoiler that you, you know that they get together. Um, but it is a very subversive book in some ways. And, you know, he's absolutely vile about the middle class English women who try and stop it happening. And in the same way, in A Passage to India, he's absolutely vile about the, 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 the British civil service in India, and he's vile about the way in which they behave towards the Indians. And he, you know, the main character is a guy called Dr. Aziz, who's Muslim, 
and he really unpacks and in, you know, portrays with great affection, you know, Dr. Aziz and the other people in India. But I'm not going to say he's perfect because at the same time as doing that, he also slightly essentializes Indian culture. And, you know, you do have this sense that he sees it as other. Um, and you do have a sense that he does kind of put it in a slightly different category. Um, and so I think, you know, he's, he's writing from his own situation in the, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and he goes a long way towards recognizing his, his great call is to connect. You know, he's famous for saying only connect. He wants individuals to be able to live and love without constraint. But he's not looking for structural change, really. And he doesn't really talk about structural change. So he wasn't very involved in kind of the restructuring of British society in the 1940s. Um, although he was, as you say, a president of the Council for Civil Liberties. So he's kind of interesting. He is himself slightly paradoxical, but he's also, you know, in some ways, he was really radical. And, yeah, I guess that resonates slightly with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he... Um, and, and I think it's really interesting that you had this, you know... But perhaps a, a, an adolescent or childhood history reading Forster and being comforted by him and having this connection with him. Um, and it's interesting you bring up the point that he wasn't really a radical. He didn't really challenge structural injustice, you know, overtly the way some of his other contemporaries did. Um, but also, you know, someone like Edward Said would look at Forster and say, nope, Orientalists, be gone. I mean, I think Said had a few more things to say, but you know, by and large, this this is where Forster would fall in Said's typology. But you you have a defense of him as well. I wonder if you wanted to say a bit more about that because I don't know how many Church of England priests actively read Edward Said and postcolonial <laughs> literature, but you are one of them. So I wondered if you wanted to say something about that. Well, I mean, Said doesn't give him all that much. He only refers to him a couple of times in Orientalism. He's not one of the, he's not one of Said's great villains, um, but he does kind of lump him into that lot. And I think Said is unfair. And I think, you know, certainly, if you... I'm not going to quote. You'll have to go home and read the book. Passage to Injury is worth it. Um, but certainly, you know, he is... He's virulently, virulently opposed to empire. And the way he describes his characters in A Passage to Injury, but not just there, but particularly there, you know, they are, they are real people. They aren't, you know, some kind of... They aren't a, ba they aren't a background to a colonial colonial novel about white people. Um, you know, they are real characters and with their real complexities. So I think, you know, they, the Said, with which I concur, concur completely, you know, the, the idea that people are essentialized and reduced by kind of white, fem, white whiteness um, is absolutely real. But I think Forster actually gets, goes beyond that, although, as I say, not entirely beyond and there is a kind of, he, he, he does have a kind of mystical thing about India, which is there slightly in the background. Mm. I think where I'd like to sort of end this round of questioning is the, the final thing that you point out about Forster. It's, you know, it's easy to pick out these elements of his identity, how he was part of the colonial system and administration and his, sort, his privileged background growing up in the UK. But he was also a gay man. I mean, and, and you know, as we celebrate Pride today in the UK and think about the advances that the LGBTQI movement has made in this country, it's easy to forget that when Forster was alive, I mean, he, he feared for his very safety, you know, because, you know, even if gay men weren't actually actively imprisoned or killed at that point, they were blackmailed. They were threatened by state and non-state authorities. Many of them committed suicide. Many of them, you know, just suffered lots of trauma. Um, and ostracism from society. So, and you run a church that's known for sort of, you know, bearing the flag of inclusion within the Church of England. So I was wondering, you know, do you want to say something about that as well? Because it's so interesting where this is heading. You know, on one hand, there is the very real need to struggle for the rights of sexual minorities. But at the same time, when we look at lots of LGBTQ activism, now in the West, it, it can kind of be like what Samia is describing with feminism. There is a white version of LGBT activism. There is a colonial variety of it as well. So I wonder if you had any thoughts about that. Hmm, lots. Um, I mean, I think it, it, I was reminded of how incredibly difficult it was to live, you know, before the liberalization, which was only in 1967. And even then it wasn't, 
it, was, it wasn't full liberalization, um, it was decriminalization, and the age of consent was still 21. Um, but in the 1930s and 40s, you know, you were genuinely at risk. There was, because he knew some of these people who were spying, and there were one or two people who were much, much more kind of out there than he was. You know, he was, he was under surveillance a lot of the time. You know, he had to, at one point, he burnt all the letters that he'd exchanged with, with someone because he was terrified that they would be found and he would be, get, go to prison. Um, so, you know, there was a kind of level of acceptance, but it was only within a very small sector of society. And he actually lived, you know, his long-term relationship was with a man called Bob, who was married, and they kind of, I don't know how they worked it out, but they did, so he lived, Bob lived with his wife most of the time, and then I think Wednesdays were for, were for, for, for Ian Forster uh, in London, and that's how it worked. And it's better than nothing, but it doesn't feel great, either for him or for Bob or for Bob's wife. And they all ended up, they were all friends. So, I mean, it was, you know, in some ways it was admirable. Um, so I think, you know, we have come a long way, but we still have an awful long, long way further to go. And I think there is, you know, I think what you say about white feminism is equally true about white LGBT activism. Um, you know, there is clearly a kind of, um, yeah, a kind of arrogance there. Um, which, which you come across occasionally. And one of the things which has been good about, you know, you and I have been together for 12 years, and part of that time, I've discovered much more about, you know, the, the LGBT activism within Islam, and, you know, the number of parallels that there are going on at the same time. So we've had very many of the same sorts of conversations um, about which, you know, I wasn't aware until now. So the kind of assumptions which are made about non-white people by white people are still, you know, extremely insidious. I, I was just thinking that this is so illustrative of, you know, the way in which intersectionality is played out because, you know, the, the layers of discrimination that occur, the sort of, the layers of privilege that we do have. So somebody like Rafia Zakaria, who is condemning, you know, white feminism as a concept, she also acknowledges her own privilege, but within that privilege, there is, you know, she's a victim of domestic violence, you know, she, had, she, she sought refuge in a, um, a shelter, at one point she was you know, uh, a single mother um, who, who was, you know, homeless for a while in a, in a country that wasn't her own. So, you know, I think, I think when you talk about Ian Forster, when you talk about sort of, you, you know, the, the kind of, the, you know, the, the, the layers of experience that the LGBTQ community have had, it's, it's really about sort of oppression. Oppression occurs from, on, on, you know, from various angles, from various... Uh, through various means, and it's about navigating op oppression, and it's about sort of, you know, being an ally when you need to step up and be an ally, and also about kind of acknowledging where you are um, perpetuating oppression as well. Thank you. I will open up to questions in a minute, but I didn't want to leave on a downer. <laughs> so, and this issue doesn't leave you on a downer, I promise you. So maybe just one final quick round robin to each one. Giles, my question to you would be, you know, and we can't ask Forster because he's no longer around unless anyone can channel him, I don't know. But um, what, what, would you, what do you think Forster, having read, you know, many of his novels and written this review, what do you think he would say to Samia's intervention and Shamim? What would Forster say to Samia and Shamim today? Um, I don't think he'd know what whiteness was and I don't think he'd know what feminism was. Um, but I think once he'd explained those things to him, um, I think he'd be completely behind you um, and behind... What's, what's the name? Rafi Zakaria. <laughs> <laughs> That's behind what I wrote. Yeah. He would say as well. What's her name? <laughs> Can you stop? I'm behind her whoever she is. <laughs> she's awfully good. She's a pretty good thing. <laughs> no, he would. He'd be, I think he'd completely get what, what, what she was talking about. Um, and I think, I was reflecting on liberal tyranny. I mean, what he hated was tyranny. And I think, in a way, he'd be really delighted if, if liberalism got so strong that it be, could be seen as tyrannical by other people in a paradoxical way because he hated the way in which people were being kind of stamped on and repressed and not able to be themselves. Um, so he'd kind of say, bring on a point where liberalism can be seen as being tyrannical in a way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. well, that's, that's not really... <laughs> that doesn't really help. <laughs> but okay, we'll, we'll, we'll open it up in a minute. But um, Samia, my question to you, my final question would be, then um, why are you still a feminist? <laughs> <laughs> because, because feminism is not you know, is not white feminism, you know, it's, you know, feminism, you know, if, if, 
if I, if I can find a space within the concept of feminism that locates my lived realities, my lived experiences, that, 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 finds, that gives me a voice, then I'm happy to identify myself as a feminist. Okay. And, and um, similar question to you, Shamim. Is there a way to rescue the L word, liberty, liberalism, liberal? Ah, that's an interesting way. Ah, personally, I mean, I mean, not, no, <laughs> it's, it's a short answer. Um, and the reason why is, is because, philosophically speaking, um, the whole idea of race and inequality and justice is actually baked within the fabric of liberal thinking. So I think for me, it's, it's, um, it's, it's an oxymoron. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Short and sweet. Let's open it. Questions, anyone? Um, we'll go with you first. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, do you think that feminists arguing about white feminism benefits the patriarchy? I, is it okay if I answer yeah. this? Yeah. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, un I, understand, I understand the question. I, um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion about sort of, you know, um, you know, we should be pulling together and lean, you know, leaning in and not sort of, um, yeah, you know, uniting against the common enemy. But but I think if if feminism or if any ideology um, becomes or, or or is you know or is a tool of oppression to some who you know locate themselves within you know, um, that, that space who, 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 you know, are being forced to sort of negate aspects of themselves to fit into that space, then this is something that should be addressed. I think all forms of, um, of, of violence on the psyche should, should be addressed. Um, and, it's, and it's just, it's, it's a process. It's a process of, you know, kind of, um, you know, developing thinking, developing activism, to be introspective. I mean, that's what we do at the Muslim Institute. That's what Critical Muslim does. You know, we, you know, we we pr we provide um, a platform for discussions and debates um, to take place that are sometimes difficult and that confront um, taboos or that, that confront sort of contentious issues. Um, and we look for solutions and we look for um, growth um, because, you know, because if if you have problems within a community, within a movement, within any context, um, and if those problems aren't addressed, you know, within and through empowering individuals within those communities, you know, empowering those who are experiencing oppression, um, then solutions will be imposed from, uh, from elsewhere, you know, solutions will be imposed from, from outside, from structures that seek to oppress the entire, you know, kind of community. So if, you know, if within, you know, if within feminism, within feminist activism, um, you, know, we, you know, we don't address problems, um, it's, that's what's, you know, perpetuating patriarchy. That's what's serving, um, you know, kind of, that's what's, you know, kind of furthering misogyny, I, I think. I think before, before we go into the next question, I mean, I'm not answering on behalf of feminists, but I'm answering as an <laughs> ally. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm answering as an ally and someone who saw something really interesting this, at this festival, actually, a few years ago, at a panel that Samia chaired, um, which was an all-Muslim woman panel on, was it the hijab and yes. Muslim feminism? Yes, yes. Um, it had Mona al Tahawi, it had mm -hmm. a couple of... Aina, oh no, no. Uh, no. Asia, yeah. uh, no, uh, Aisha, Aisha Malik. Aisha Malik. So it, it was a combination of Muslim women who were wearing hijab and Muslim women who weren't wearing the hijab. And Mona al Tahawi was throwing the cat among the pigeons. Like she was asking difficult questions to all these other Muslim women on the panel. And it got quite, you know, salty and heated at some point. Um, but at the end of it, Mona Al-Tahawi, it's not that everyone agreed with everything Mona Al-Tahawi said or anything everyone else said on the panel, but the beautiful thing was Mona then turned to the audience and said, this is what you all must understand as well. Whether it is misogyny on behalf of Islamism or whatever you want to call it, or Islamophobia, you know, the, the danger is we all want to see all Muslim women as homogenous. 
We want to see them agree with each other. We don't like seeing them disagree with each other. And when they disagree with each other, we think, oh, you know, it's a disunited movement. And she's like, no, I am challenging these women as a fellow Muslim woman, but I actually really love them, and you need to see that. You need to see that we can argue with each other, and we can respect each other, and we can love each other. And there was this beautiful moment where they all gave each other a huge hug at the end. I don't think it was just a PR exercise. I mean, if you know Monal, <laughs> Monal Tahawi, it's like, it's really hard. <laughs> I mean, she is a force of nature. Mm. But I loved it. I loved that moment where she was like, this mm. is us having a real conversation, and you need to see this. And it's acknowledging right. that liberation comes in different forms, in different yeah. ways. So for someone wearing the hijab is a form of liberation. For someone wearing the niqab is a form of liberation. You know, that m might not be somebody else's form of liberation, but if that's what liberates them, then we, that's, what we should, that's how we should respect that and create spaces within the concept of, li of liberation. Yeah. And I think the other thing which is important is that we, there are some white feminists whose assumptions need to be challenged. Um, you know, I remember sitting at breakfast after a church service a few years ago with two very strong women who've been, who had been very involved in Greed and Common and all that kind of stuff, you know, they were very kind of <laughs> up there. But they were being really kind of vitriolic about Islam um, in a really unpleasant way. Um, they were making all sorts of assumptions. Um, and I think that has to be challenged somehow. And you know, the more that we do that, the better, really. Thank you. Um, uh, question to you. Hi, uh, thank you for that. Um, when you were talking about white feminism, the, the idea that came to my mind is white privilege. Because, uh, you know, you're talking about the North South divide and this notion about the difference of unrest, and they've seen white clothes pushed by certain people. And somehow, some people are more equal than others. And at that time, they seem to fit that ideology. And people trying to fit in. Mm -hmm. They come across and say, what we say is the right. I mean, that's, that's an idea that came to me about this. So you're talking about uh, that author and her book and stuff. So how, what, what do you think about that, the concept of white privilege within um, feminist activism? Mm -hmm. so, so I think, you know, um, you know what, I think it's, it's not about, you know, white people, it's about whiteness, which is, you know, the, it, it's, it's the normative way in which whiteness, you know, white is right, you know, sort of, who gets to define, um, you know, what is normal, who gets to define what the parameters of feminism um, are, you know, who, who gets to construct these notions, and if it's specific to, you know, this Western-centric, uh, first world, uh, white context and lived experience, then, then that is whiteness. And in terms of white privilege, I think privilege comes in very many different ways. I mean, I'm a very privileged middle class, you know, person of, of Pakistani origin. Um, you know, there's class privilege, there's ableism, there's, you know, um, you know, there's there's race. There, so, so I think um, again, you know, we were talking about intersectionality, and you know, inter, you know, intersectionality is is very much about sort of understanding wherein you know the, you know your identity affords you privilege in some ways and then where you ha where it's your an obligation to step up and be an ally so if you're a you know heteronormative you know um, cis male then you know that's that's one set of privileges you have and you know um, you know there's there's gender there's class so so so, so white privilege again is a, is a con it's a concept that we should be always interrogating, understanding, um, seeking to dismantle. But it's not the only form of privilege. I wonder if Giles or Shamim wants to come in. Yeah, I'm speaking, speaking to well. oh, thank you. No, Shemim. I think I think Samuel's done really well actually. <laughs> yeah, I think, no, I think this, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. yeah. I, yes, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I think this. I, I think the lady in the front had a question. Thank you so much. My soul. I mean, I'm an absolute feminist, white, post-colonial Scottish convert, and so, and I've been thinking a lot about these issues of hate because of the very very same thing. Oh, okay. And I've been trying to write and find a voice that says we are crushed <coughs> religious, political absolutes, 
And what comes to me, and it comes to me again now, this is, this is Gillian Miller's <coughs> concept of the broken middle, that we have to walk the broken glass in the middle where all the grand narratives are fractured. And thinking through this, I've been really thinking about the contrast between dialectical cultures and dialogical cultures. And what I'm hearing here is a culture of dialogues. And what I'm hearing from the US particularly at the moment is a dialectical culture. And I mean, we could unwind Brexit. But it's, it's just the sacredness, actually, mm. of these broken spaces. And I just want to thank you for that. Mm. But to throw that idea out there, you know, and growing up with white privilege certainty, but navigating things. And I speak like this because as a little girl, first I wanted to lose my Scottish accent, <laughs> then I wanted to lose my Southern African accent in England, of course I'm from a farm in South Africa, and on it goes, reinventing ourselves all the time. I'm not being hit, I'm not being hit in this, depending on what group, I'm trying not to get shouted to <laughs> Thank you so much for responding. Yeah, 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 if you'd no, like I th to. I think it fits in quite well with the um, the short paper that I wrote, actually. Because what, you, what you've got um, is the, uh, I mean, you rightly mentioned, uh, liberalism is one of those grand narratives. And it's within our own lifetime that we're actually seeing this grand, grand narrative fracture. Um, and, and the fracturing basically happens um, on the back of a certain response, uh, especially within the US context. And the US context that you've got, you've got Trump and you've got Bannon. Um, now, Bannon actually tra traces his kind of idea through Evola, through the kind of the traditional kind of, kind of ideas, if you like. So, 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 so you've got you've got a replacement of liberal values, an attempt of replacing liberal values with a sense of traditional kind of uh, ways of looking at the world. So, so it's it's it doesn't. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is is that these these responses don't necessarily come out of a certain vacuum. Um, you know, there are kind of lineages, there are philosophical kind of intellectual kind of heritage that individuals are kind of kind of drawing upon, if you like. And and, and I think I think um, as, as a way of understanding those 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 perhaps issues, not necessarily the surface. And I think it's it's most important to actually dig a little bit deep to actually find out where some of those some of those patterns and some of those kind of issues are actually being informed informed by. Can I just Yeah? I was just thinking about my response to your initial question about Shamin's book, and that's why I was being a little bit facetious. But I think what, what Forster would have been pleased with now is the sense that there is this, there, we are able to kind of discover who we are, and we are, you know, regardless of where we come from, we're able to kind of work out our own identities in a way which, you know, we were probably, many of us weren't able to until, you know, relatively recently. Um, but I also think, it, it, listen to you, I mean, his great word was muddle. I mean, and he used to say things are a real muddle, and you, he used to say you can't really work things out. And, you know, I, I can't remember which, there was one, one of his books, you know, it kind of ends with saying it's all a terrible muddle. But I just want to read the, the last bit of, of my article, because it, it really resonates with what you've just said, um, kind of telling us that there aren't any easy answers, and we just have to, to kind of engage, connect. His novels are stories about individual struggles to overcome the destructive power of convention and privilege. They're about the glimmering of light in a world of darkness. Perhaps that's the most we can hope for. Liberty for Forster meant freedom to connect, only that. And then this is a quote from him. The greater the darkness, the brighter shine the little lights, reassuring one another, signaling, signaling, well, at all events, I'm still here. I don't like it very much, but how are you? <laughs> Thank you for that. I mean, before we move to the last question, I, I really appreciate your intervention. And I think, you know, speaking as one of the editors of Critical Muslim, just a general observation is, I really like the anthology formats. Like for 10 years, what we've been doing is we have a topic and we publish it as an anthology. And I think that's one way to sort of question what a grand narrative is. We know the sorts of people that we'd like to commission to write a piece, but very often as editors, we don't really know what we're going to get until we get it. And when we write the introduction, sometimes it's a challenge trying to think, well, how does this issue fit? I mean, it fits because you know, we commission based on the issues that we've decided, but 
you know, the writing of the introduction, the editing of the issue itself is a learning process. And I think I really liked what you said about just making our way through the broken middle, making sense of the fragments, because this is what every issue is like. It's those fragments, trying to turn them into a mosaic, trying to turn chaos into cosmos. It's never complete, mm. but I think it's the act of trying that is so, you know, it's so wonderful and so rewarding. So thank you for that. But the, the final uh, question I'll give to Bobby. Yeah, one, yeah, just the final one, yeah. Just one very quick question, um, to pick up with Ian said, which I think is very interesting you asked him, um, is there a way of sort of saving the river and he said no. Uh, and what then follows from that is if you can disarticulate literally in terms of liberation, why is it that every time we talk about liberation, we start falling back into liberalism by focusing on things on nationality, on individualism, on pluralism, what all of those things are in. I wonder if there's a channel answer for that, for the critique of liberalism, either we're not taking it seriously, or we're just looking around here in these spaces, <laughs> or yeah. it's actually um, something which is perhaps beyond the way that it's been framed. Yeah. No, no, it's I think... It's going to be very quick. Yeah, I mean, really, really quickly, I mean, this, this um, I mean, mo most, most of uh, the sociology textbooks um, starts off with you know, the likes of Kim Licker or Chet Taylor, etc. So, so, so you kind of almost get hardwired into looking at the world through liberal values as inclusive, as tolerant, etc. And it's only when you actually go out of the canon, out of those kind of classical, kind of accepted kind of canon, if you like, then you're, you're able to actually uh, develop a, a counter reading of the text. Um, and, and I think, I th I th I th I think you, you know, you're actually right. And I think it's the more that we kind of encourage people to actually read outside the canons, read outside the, not necessarily the core textbooks, actually get them and encourage them to actually think much more kind of critically. Um, I mean, I, th I think, I mean, uh, uh, Rashid Skinner's here. I mean, uh, I remember a wonderful paper that he actually presented at the University of Huddersfield. And it was, it was looking at, if I'm not mistaken, you know, the, 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 the canon within psychology and how that's actually rooted within a certain kind of uh, a Christological Eurocentric worldview and how you kind of then use that kind of, you know, the canon as a way of making sense of Muslim life in the streets of Bradford. You, you know, there's an there's a inherent kind of contradiction, um, and, you know, because within kind of Christianity there's, there's, there's a heritage, there's a tradition of getting people to actually speak you know, openly about their, you know, sins and what have you. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's an accepted kind of culture that goes within that. And, and that culture isn't there within certain kind of Eastern, Eastern heritages. So I think, it's, I think it's, it's almost kind of encouraging the students to actually read against the grain, if you like. And I think the more that we do that, the more it's going to be much, much more better because it doesn't necessarily fit in with individuals' lived experiences. Um, Thank you. Um, very quickly, if Samuel Giles had. Just um, quickly, uh, in relation to this point, I would say, you know, I, I, would, I would encourage everyone to look at the constructedness of these concepts. Who gets to define, you know, what, liberaliz what liberalism is, what, you know, who gets to decide what, what, what is, um, you know, what is the norm, what is the centre, who locates the centre? Um, and, you know, and, and who falls out of, you know, beyond the margins, who's on the fringes? That's, I think, where we should look to. And I think, yeah, 30 seconds. Liberalism and freedom, I think, are two really interesting words. Shannon talks about that in his introduction. I think there's something about, I think the idea of freedom is slightly different to the idea about, of liberalism. Freedom is about kind of how society works, and liberalism feels quite individual. And I think there's something there, but we haven't got time to go into it. And just two words, Vinay Lal's essay in this issue um, doesn't answer everything in your question, but I think goes a long way to address some of those concerns. So try it. So read us, write for us, talk to us. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and we've got some books on display. We've got an event this afternoon, uh, 75th anniversary of Pakistan. And then tomorrow is the launch of Critical Muslim Bodies. One of our speakers is here, James Brooks. Um, sorry, did I, <laughs> did I pluralize your name? Okay, right. And so, and thank you so much to our speakers. Um, a round of applause for them. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you all of you, thank you.